find rental properties with good cash flow with MAPS Coach Heidi Four. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be available within 24 hours on the MAPS Fast Track YouTube channel. Currently, everyone's on mute. However, if you have any questions for Heidi, please type them into the chat box. Following the meeting, if you have any questions about today's call or our other coaching programs, please email us at fasttrack at kw.com. And that's all for me, Heidi. Take it away. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for being here today. I am absolutely so excited to share with you all of the great ways that you can find rental properties with good cash flow in this market. Yes, with home prices the way they are. Yes, with interest rates the way they are, you can still find deals. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. A little bit about me so that you know um, who is talking right now. I'm Heidi Four. I've been a realtor for over 20 years and I've been a MAPS coach with Keller Williams for seven years. I currently owned 59 rental units and I bought all of them in the last five years, in the last 60 months in a low inventory market when everybody was saying, you can't find any deals right now. I'm like, yeah, you can, you have to look for them and you can. So right now I'm currently under contract for two more units that uh, I'll share with you how I got them later on in today. And that is what today is about. How am I still finding units with good cash flow? How am I still adding to my rental inventory? Uh, and it's been an average of one a month for 60 months in, in a market that currently everybody says is the prices are too high. Well, they're not. And I'm going to going to tell you all the places that you might not be looking that you could start looking for these deals. So before taking action on anything in this class, I should say these things. One, talk to an attorney before you do anything or make offers. Two, talk to your accountant about your specific tax situation. Talk to your financial planner about where you should have your cash and talk to your realtor if you're not a realtor about a deal before you move forward with a purchase. I am not an attorney or a, an accountant. So what you'll learn today is the actual places where I look to find deals and where I have found deals in the past. I'm going to share with you tools to save you time when you're analyzing properties to make sure it is a good deal. I'm going to share with you systems to help you be organized, be efficient, save time. And uh, systems is just a checklist that's repeatable. And people that can help you find potential properties. System tools and people are ways to help you save time and be more efficient and get further faster in your journey towards financial freedom. Now, today is just a 30 minute sample of an eight hour course that I teach called Fund Your Big Life with Rental Properties. So we're just kind of water skiing through the surface on this subject today. If you want more information about finding properties and criteria for properties, uh, please go to fundyourbiglife.com and look for information on the full course. So the first thing we need to do in the discussion around how do I find properties with good cash flow is define good cash flow. What does that mean? Well, it means something different to every investor that I know. Every single person uh, that I talk with has a different definition of what is a good deal to them. What is good cash flow to them? Sometimes investors say, I just want to look at annual profit. How many dollars am I getting from this property after expenses per month and per year? Some investors say, I just want to see a cash on cash return, a percentage. If I put this dollar amount of cash into purchasing a property, I need a certain percentage each year that is profit as a return on investment. Some investors say, I just want to know, does the monthly rent, is the monthly rent 1% of the sales price, or is the monthly rent 2% of the sales price? That's how some investors define good cash flow. They call that the 1% rule or the 2% rule. Some investors say, uh, I want to find a duplex or a fourplex, and I want it to be so profitable that even if half the building is vacant or the tenants aren't paying, that I'm still making money on it. And they call that the 50% rule. So people have these different rules that they follow and they don't break. And if they find, when they find a property that follows that rule that meets that criteria, then they jump on it. So that's the step one for you as an investor is know what your criteria is. Define good cash flow for you so that when you find a property that meets that criteria, then you'll jump on it. Uh, over in the chat, you'll see a link to that 
to that course also that I talked about earlier. Also in the chat, if you want to write your questions down, sometimes our chat gets overflowing with questions and I can't get to them all in 30 minutes. So if that happens, don't worry, I will email you. I will copy your questions and I'll find you and, and respond to you by email uh, after the course ends. But I'll try my best to leave uh, enough time at the end of this course for your questions. So ideally, um, when you're looking at different cities for cash flow, you'll be able to find properties with good cash flow in your city. And we know that some places right now, it's really tough to get cash flow, uh, make profit on in certain cities because prices are so high and rents are so low. Uh, oh, I just saw a question in the chat. Is this being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. Yes, I will send you the video. How will you access the recording? I will send you, send you an email and there will be a link in it and you click on it and you watch the recording. Also, it's gonna be on the MAPS Fast Track YouTube channel. So back to the slides. So research for different cities. Look at your city first. If you can't find something, go to the next cities nearby. You might need to go 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away. I went 30 minutes away and I found this incredible city where it, it meets all of my criteria. Uh, here's what I look for in cities. I want to see that the median household income is 48 times the monthly median rent amount. Here's why. Because when I ask, ask for tenants who, who want to rent my properties and I ask for their income, I want to know that the rent isn't going to be more than a third of their income. So ideally, the median household income amount for a city is 48 times the monthly median rent amount. I also want to look and see in a city that the monthly median rent is at least 0.6% of the median purchase price. I want to see that 30 to 50% of the population rents their home. I want to see that the population has grown every year for the last three years. I also wanted to not get into cities where the property taxes are too high on investment properties. In some places, you, you'll ask, what are the, the taxes here, the county taxes? And you'll say, and you might hear they're 1% of the assessed value. Well, that might only be true if it's a primary residence. You need to make sure that you're asking, what about if it's an investment property, non-owner occupied? because in some places then it could be 2% or more. I always want to make sure it's low crime rates, otherwise you're going to end up with constant tenant turnover if your properties keep getting vandalized or somebody keeps breaking in and stealing things, if somebody keeps stealing your air conditioners or stealing the copper, it, this happens in places. So while there, there is nowhere in the world where there's zero crime, there are places where there's lower instances of crime, and that will help you be more profitable, help you have better cash flow if you're not constantly repairing things that are damaged because of crime. Um, someone says, where do you go to find these stats for each city? Google, go on Google. And um, one of the places that Google constantly shows me when I'm researching is niche.com, N-I-C-H, I'm going to write it over here, N-I-C-H-E.com, and I put in the city or the zip code, and it tells me all these things. Um, it's really interesting. So here's what niche.com told me when I looked into some of these states here. So the first thing that I did was I went on Google and I said, um, what are the states that have the cheapest properties, most affordable properties. And I found all of these states. These There were at least five or six different sites and they all had these states, some in different orders, but these same states. And so I was like, all right, let's just pick a few of them. And I'm very familiar with Kentucky, Indiana and Ohio. So I started there um, and Illinois, it's also near, near us where I am. And so here's what I found when I was just, I was just going into niche.com and looking at different cities. Place in Illinois, the median rent is $1,300 a month and the median purchase price is $113,000. If you are an investor that says, I need something that, that is better than the 1% rule, where at least 1% of the purchase price I can get in rent, then this city is for you. Um, in Louisville, Kentucky, there's a zip code where 58% of the population rents their residence. The median rent is $800 a month and the median home is about $80,000 a month or $80,000 purchase price. So that meets the 1% rule. Muncie, Indiana, same thing. That's right around the 1% rule, 51% rent. Dayton, Ohio, it's a, a, it's a large, not a large city, but it's a good sized city. Um, the median rent is like $766 median home price is about $73,000, 50 percent rent. So if you're looking at, at these types of cities, then you you can make 2000 to 3000 a year in passive income even after paying a property manager um, 
you're getting 8% cash on cash return. And that's figuring in a mortgage interest rates of six and a half percent. So you, there really are cities right now where you can get that 1% rule or you can get 8% cash on cash return, or you can get $200 a month cash flow after expenses and after property management fees. So if you're like, well, I don't even know what to put in for the interest rate, Heidi. Well, here's two places where you can go. You can go to bankrate.com and check 30-year mortgage rates there, or you can go to your local credit union. I found that they post their local mortgage, mortgage rates for your area. And then you can put the local mortgage rates where you are for an investment property, non-owner occupied, put those numbers either into a Google sheet. This is where the tools come in. A tool can be a Google sheet that you use or an Excel sheet that you use, or it could be an app. The two apps that I like to use for two different purposes are, well, there's a spreadsheet that you can use. Um, Ballpark Deal is one of the apps, and this is for Apple or for Android. You put the your criteria in and tell it like, here's what I need to see. I need to see whatever it is, $200 a month cash flow or a certain cap rate. You put that in and then you put in all of the specifics about the property. And you can see here, there's what, like maybe 15 different things that you enter in. And then it tells you at the top, red, red light or green light on this property. And this is a great app to use on the go. Like if you're out if you're a realtor, you're out showing houses and you're thinking, I wonder if this would be a good rental property. You could pull your phone out, put the numbers in here and see if it turns red or green at the top. Um, if it does turn green, you're like, well, maybe this would be a good property to look into. Then you might want to do some more digging, more investigating and go to this website, dealcheck.io. I'm going to put that into the chat too. Deal, dealcheck.io. And it's free. And so it, there's a lot more than 15 things you put into this, but it gives you a much better report too. It gives you all of these really great key performance indicators, some really great financial stats on the potential property you're looking at. It helps me make decisions and it helps the people that I work with, the investors I work with and the coaching clients that I work with make decisions. So I, I highly recommend all three for different reasons. One is like, if you're trying to figure out a formula, some what ifs that don't fit into ballpark deal or deal check, you might want to use your own spreadsheet. Ballpark deal is for when you're on the go. Deal check is when you're in front of your computer and you want to create a really good report. Um, I also use those deal check reports when I'm sending potential properties to my investor clients and I say, hey, take a look at this report and it tells them everything they need to know about the numbers. So those are the tools that I suggest that can help you decide if something is a property that has good cash flow. Now let's talk about systems. Systems are ways to make you efficient and help you be repeatable in your success. So systems in this situation would be following a calendar, scheduling times on your calendar um, to go look for properties. And I save the links to the places where I, where I look for properties on my calendar as a recurring event. So all I have to do is follow my calendar, click on the links in the calendar, then I know where to go to look for properties. Schedule recurring networking events on the calendar and follow your calendar. Schedule time to drive around areas and look for houses that need, need work where the owner maybe doesn't take care of it anymore. Schedule time to send postcards or letters and have a checklist that you use every single time that you evaluate a property. Have a checklist that you use every time you write an offer. Decide on your criteria that you must have and wait. Wait to find a property that meets your criteria. Don't force a house into a, pur a purchase by violating your rules of your criteria. People, people to help you find properties. We talked about systems, tools, and people are your leverage for growing your portfolio. So people could be realtors in different cities. Like at where I live, um, we're on the border of the Ohio River. And on one side of the river like is Louisville, Kentucky. On the other side is New Albany, Indiana and Jeffersonville, Indiana. And then up the river a little bit is Madison, Indiana. And up a little bit further is Cincinnati, Ohio. And, and then across the river is Newport, Kentucky and Bellevue, Kentucky and um, Fort Thomas, Kentucky. So we've got realtors in those areas that also look for deals and we, you uh, have good relationships with each other. So if your area isn't a great place to find deals, get to know realtors in different cities, different areas. Go to networking events. I go to one networking event every single week where there are going to be investors there. And I talk to everybody in the room, try to hit the whole room up and let them know what I'm looking for, what my clients are looking for. 
give them my contact information, see how I can help them really work those networking events. It has become my favorite place to find deals. Retiring landlords is another one. Your friends and family that know people that have a house to sell, they don't want to clean it up. They don't want to put on the MLS. They know it needs work. Uh, people that you know that know people who are getting older that you know, have a house to sell and they don't have the time, energy, money, or desire to update it to get the best price possible. They might just want a quick sale and would sell it to you and it might be a good rental property. If you have an assistant or would like to hire an assistant, one of the things that they can do is help you look for properties. This could be somebody that is actually in the office with you or it could be a virtual assistant that lives in a different city somewhere else in the world, but they could go look at all the sites for you every day, put them through those apps and websites that I told you about, and then come to you with the deals. They could also send out postcards and letters for you as well. Uh, the apps and websites that I use to find properties um, are listed here on the screen. As get it set up on the, I set myself up on the MLS. Uh, I'm in part of three different MLSs and I've set myself up to get email alerts when something comes on the market. And yeah, I have found good deals on the MLS before. Yes, I got into multiple offer situations. Yes, it was a bidding war and I don't always win. This last time I didn't win. I, uh, I The person that won uh, was a cash offer and it was more than mine. And I stayed in touch with the agent and I said, could I please send in a backup offer? She said, it's a waste of time. This is a cash deal. It's going to close like in a week. And I said, I understand that. And is it okay if I send in an offer? She's like, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. Well, guess what? That person couldn't get all their cash together. They couldn't close on it in the next week. And I got the house in a bidding war and no one else even tried to make a backup offer. So that's my advice to you. Don't be scared to make an offer on something on the MLS. Go ahead and if you don't win, be the backup offer. Sometimes the backup offer wins. I go to for sale by owner websites. I look at the county foreclosure websites where foreclosures are auctioned. I also look at online auction companies that aren't necessarily foreclosures. They're, they're just auction companies. Uh, I also go get addresses out of list source. Some people use PropStream or Deal Machine. And uh, I use that for sending letters and postcards. What do you put on the postcards, Heidi? I'll show you. Here's my postcard system. I find my ideal area, my ideal respondent, who I think will respond to my postcards. I create the front of the postcard using Canva, and I'll show it to you in a second, and I'll show you the back of the postcard too. And I always make my postcards very like one-to-one, -one, not one-to-many. And like when I, when I write a letter, I write a postcard, I make it from Heidi to a person instead of from a company to a company. It's a total, like you have to think of your message as being a a, a two-way conversation instead of just like an advertising message being broadcast out. So message and method are, of course, like what makes advertising successful. You have to have the right method, you have to be spoken to the right audience with the right message. So we have to find where the ideal respondent gets their mail by buying a list of addresses. And then I save that CSV file in my Google Sheet. And then I make changes to that Google Sheet as people email me, text me, or call me when they get my postcards. And I'll, I'll show that on another screen in a second. So then you have to decide what company you want to print your postcards if you're going to do postcards. Uh, uh, you could use Vistaprint, you can use um, Postcard Mania, a lot of different places that print postcards for you. Um, some of them do mail merge where like you can type a message to someone and they will mail merge in that person's first name. Some of them actually have Google Street View images of the property where you can put, if you're asking someone about their property, you can put a picture of their property on the postcard. Just double check their work. Ask for a proof before it goes out. Uh, I've, I've caught some mistakes um, by doing that. And, and when people call you, not everybody's going to be really excited to get mail from you. Some people are going to say, I don't know why you're sending me a postcard. I'm never going to move. Okay, just be kind. And if somebody says, um, I, I, I'm not going to move, there's no way I'm going to move. And then they call you back a week later and they're like, remember last week when I said I wasn't going to move? Well, things have changed now. Maybe I do want to move. Just keep being kind and be persistent with people that say that they might move there or maybe and send a new postcard every six weeks. Sometimes people respond to the second or third postcard that don't respond to the first and have your offer ready to go. I, uh, when I tell people I'd like to send them an offer on their house, I have an offer ready to go. I'm not just saying I might send you an offer on your house. I'm like, I, I will send you an offer on your house, contingent upon a walkthrough, contingent upon potentially even an inspection and potentially an appraisal. But I will have an offer, send them an offer. And then I mail it to them or give it to them in person and, and 
that has been a, a great way that I've picked up properties over the last few years. I like to write messages by hand, take a picture of them and put them on postcards. And you can decide, like this is just a piece of notebook paper that I used a Sharpie to write a message on. And then I left a space for my photo. You might be like, that's weird to put your picture on a postcard. But if, if you want to leave, leave space, you can. Here's what it looked like when I did. Hi, I'm Heidi. Would you consider selling your house to me? And I will put a little picture on it with a flower. Like, I'm a real person. Be nice to me. And uh, that got responses. And this is who I sent it to. I bought the list on List Source, and I sent it to these. Uh, I started uh, narrowing down the list because I wasn't going to send out 29,000 postcards. I wanted just to send it down to like, like 1,500 people. And so on the back of it, it had this mail merge message. And I used um, a Gmail address and a cell phone number instead of a call this 1-800 number and use the prompts that you hear to leave me a message. Like that's just so business and corporate and not one-to-one. -one. I, I didn't want, I wanted to do a one-to-one -one message. I wanted it to sound like, hi, I'm Heidi. I'm a real person. And I'm wondering if I could send you an offer to buy 123 Main Street, just like me to you, not company to you. Um, and I found that that got good responses and I used that Google Street photo. And in our state, all I have to do is put the name of the brokerage somewhere on the advertisement. So put it at the bottom, it says KWLE Realty Group. Uh, Keller Williams Louisville East Realty Group um, and th that is compliant with our state laws so make sure you're following your state laws ask your broker before you send out advertising then I kept notes in here of the people who said yes no or maybe so after I downloaded all of the addresses I put them in here and they are green if it was like yes they said make an offer orange if they said yeah maybe I'll, have to, I'll get back with you and I just kept them green until they until uh, we did a transaction. And then once they said, yes, send me an offer, I made this Google form and uh, I can send an offer out in seven minutes using my Google form because Google forms has an add-on called forms publisher. And if you, um, I don't have time to go through it here, but in my full eight hour course I do, I'll show you how to do it. Um, but I, this is what it looks like. You can go look up online, Google forms publisher, and you can make a, an offer to go out within seven minutes it doesn't take long write offers and get them out so where this fits into the whole picture though of financial freedom is just one little bit this part that i talked about today the finding the properties and de deciding if there are good deals comes after you identify what type of home you want do you do you want a house a bunch of houses would you rather have just one large apartment complex would you like to have condos um, do you want to do uh, go in a city where it's better for short-term rentals or a city where it's better for long-term rentals? Are you going to need a property manager or are you going to do this yourself? All of those things affect this process of finding them. So the first thing you have to do is decide what is your vision of financial freedom? How many houses do you want to eventually own or units? Units um, you know, or doors is another way to say units. If you have a fourplex, there might be four apartments in one building. That's four doors or four units, but it's one property. So um, it's it's better to, instead of saying um, properties, to think of units and how much my preferred way of thinking this and doing the calculation is what how many dollars do I need per unit in order for it to be a good deal? So uh, there are some people that say, I just need like $1 uh, uh, per unit. I'm fine with that. Just don't lose money. I, I want to buy for the really great tax advantages. I need somewhere to put... Um, all of this money that I've made and I don't want to pay taxes on it. So find me something that's going to be a tax deduction. And some people say, well, I want to make $500 per month per door. And so you have to decide what that is for you. Um, the, the higher amount that you, that you want per door that you've decided on, the more properties you're going to need to look at to find it. There's just going to be less things that fit your criteria. Uh, so just decide you're going to put that time in. And just learn to get good, get quick about using that ballpark deal app or the dealcheck.io or your spreadsheet so that you can quickly analyze properties that you find and you can say yes or no quickly and be able to write that offer quickly if it is a yes. Um, after you've decided the type of real estate that's right for you and 
and where it is, then you've got to decide how you're going to pay for it. Are you, and, and that's, a, that's another class. Hopefully you came to that class. I taught a, a couple weeks ago on the many different ways to pay for rental properties. So uh, that is also going to affect your cash flow, how you pay for it. If you're using um, a debt partner, a private money lender, hard money, are you just using cash? Are you using a home equity line of credit on your primary residence? All of those things are going to be numbers that you enter in into that app or your spreadsheet or into deal check a website. Uh, so you're going to have to decide that first of how you're going to pay for it and the type of real estate that's right for you. Then you go find the house. And then after you find the house, you make some good, smart changes to the house, like with paint and with flooring and with lights and with landscaping so that you get the most, uh, the most amount of rent possible. And then you can go advertise it to find tenants handle their applications and their leases. I, you know, I use Google Forms for leases too and collect their rent payments. You can actually do all of this, the, a lot of the management through Google tools, which are all free and not, you don't have to pay for you know, special, special websites and apps for landlords. You can run a lot of it through, it's like 99% through Google tools um, and free apps on your phone. Then after you've got some really great renters in your properties and they're taking good care of your properties, you're just, your job at that point is just to repair things as they just normally break and track your key performance indicators, track your income every month, track your expenses on each property, track, track it as a whole as well, track your net worth, and then research after you're tracking your income and expenses, then you're going to know that you pay taxes on the income, what's left over on the profit. So then we're going to figure out how to save money on the taxes on that profit and decide when it's time, if it's ever time, to upgrade the one property for a better property. And at that point, if you're like, okay, I'm making good profit here. I don't need to do, be the property manager anymore. I'm going to pay someone to do the bookkeeping. I'm going to pay someone to do property management, to collect the rent, to do the repairs. And that's when you really have financial freedom. When you can just go lay on a beach for six weeks at a time and uh, not have to do anything with the properties. That's true financial freedom. And at that point, your, your only job is to make sure that they're protected, make sure they are, are, they are always in the right entity structure. It's sitting in the right LLCs. The, the LLCs are structured the right way. You have the right insurance. You have the right property managers. Um, so that's an overview of everything that we discuss in the Fund Your Big Life course. And the, the course is eight one-hour sessions, and they start next week on the 8th, yay, March 8th. There's a Facebook group that's only for course attendees where you can ask questions and um, even bring each other deals. And uh, you get a workbook that I wrote. It's filled with 100 pages of content and all my checklists that I use every step of the way. And uh, I'm going to share with you my secrets, my the things that I did well and the mistakes that I made so that you won't make them uh, when I was buying all of my properties. And uh, I'll share with you my spreadsheet that I had on the screen earlier. And you get to ask me questions about your potential deals during the class that you might buy. And um, I'll help you you know, think through things. And you can watch the course live uh, with your spouse or your business partner, or you can, uh, if, if you have something going on the day after work, then just watch the recording later because all of the eight sessions are recorded. You can watch them, watch them later. Um, and we actually have a discount code for webinar attendees today. It's um, the discount code, the coupon code is web15. Web as in webinar, 15 as in 15% 15 off. So um, that is the best code um, out there. It's webinar web 15. It's our webinar code for you for coming today to the webinar. Here is what some people say that have taken the course. They said it's a great step-by-step -step content, very helpful for someone building their portfolio. And it says, whether you're new to investing or seasoned, you're gonna get good stuff out of it. Um, someone else said great class, very detailed, helps you get to your net worth goals faster. Yes, it is very detailed. I'm a very detailed person. I'm a person that is very structured with money and steps and processes. And that could be a strength and a weakness. Uh, sometimes I, uh, I'm a little too detailed for some people. And they're like, really, did you have to use so many words? Like, yeah, I did. 
Uh, so I will share all my details and spreadsheets and numbers and processes and checklists with you. And I hope I see you there. Um, where is the link to register for the course? Someone put in the chat. Well, you can scan the QR code on the screen or you can go to fundyourbiglife.com. Oh, uh, good. Someone said it's always nice to take a 30 minute webinar and get three action items right away. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, I'm a high C of the disc, Holly. That's true. Um, and Heidi Theodore says, thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for being here. If I didn't get to your uh, messages in the chat, I will email you, I promise. See you soon.